All right, so uh, as Robert said, I'm a hopefully graduating PhD student in the UIUC Statistics Department. So this fall, or last fall rather, I went through the whole process of looking for and applying to a mixture of data science and quantitative research jobs. Um, so what I'm going to do today is sort of run you guys through a little bit of the experience that I had, um, sort of the general outline of what the process looks like, and the sorts of questions and things that I was asked, and also sort of some of the ways that I prepared for the job search. Um, so with that, I just want to say that um, this is my anecdotal experience. Um, I, I have a few, you know, sort of uh, peculiarities that are specific to my situation. So. What I'm going to say, I think, is generally applicable to everyone, but you know, when you're, when you're thinking about the information that I'm giving you and applying it to your own situation, um, just you know, keep in mind that these, these sorts of things are specific to, to different people and, and different situations. Um, so as part of that, to give you a little bit of my background, so I did my undergrad at Ohio State. Uh, I studied economics and math. Um, I'm currently a PhD student in statistics here at UIUC. And I have a little bit of previous internship experience, so I was an intern at the United States Treasury Department for a summer, uh, and I also worked at State Farm here at the Research Park uh, during the school year and summer for about a year, a year and a half or so. Um, so, and these, and also, uh, I'm going to apologize ahead of time for all of the highly pixelated pictures that I have. I just pulled them off of Google Maps or, or Google, so. Um, so my job search was a little bit unique uh, because I was geographically constrained to only looking in two cities, primarily in Boston and New York, um, due to my partner. Um, so this means that I'm only, I only have a perspective on sort of a, a, a limited view of companies. Uh, and by that I mean, I didn't really interview at, for example, like any Silicon Valley type companies. Um, I didn't really interview, well, some of them I did, but I didn't really interview with like startups that you might find in Silicon Valley or things like that. Most of the places that I ended up interviewing at were sort of large financial institutions and sort of a, a smattering of other tech companies as well. So for example, if you really want to go to Facebook, uh, I apologize because I didn't interview at Facebook because they really only have positions in California. Uh, okay, so this here, um, these, these here are all companies in which I either received a job offer or I got to the step right before getting an offer and didn't receive one, right? So as I mentioned, um, there's quite a bit of uh, finance in here, um, also some tech companies and a, a consulting company. So when I give you guys sort of my, my perspective on the job search, you should know that this is; these are primarily the companies that I'm pulling, pulling my information from. So when I talk about things that I was asked or the typical process, uh, it, it's mostly designed towards the experiences that I had from these places. Um, but that said, that that selection of companies is is sort of just the tip of the iceberg, in the sense that what I'm showing you, what I'm showing you. This previous slide is is basically you know my my thin Homer my my best self sort of with all all the bad stuff hidden. And by all the bad stuff, I mean what you're seeing here are you know uh, what you're seeing there are a bunch of companies that I got really I got offers or I got really far in the interview process. But what you're not seeing are all the other jobs that I had to apply to just so I could get that list of companies that you know offered me or I got to find around the interviews. Okay, so. That's also something that, that I'm going to make sure to leave you with is that the, the process in general of, of finding a job is frankly uh, time consuming and, and fairly difficult. So you, you're going to need to apply, and I certainly needed to apply to a lot of different places. And all, all of those places that I applied to are sort of what you're not seeing here that's sort of you know, hidden, hidden by the, the skinny homer facade. Um, okay. So. In, in my experience, the, the standard process for getting a job was, you know, after you apply or get contacted by a recruiter, you have uh, an HR phone screen. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that. Um, essentially, it's, you know, tell me a little bit about yourself, tell me about your background, 
why did you apply to X place or why do you want to work at X place? They're very standard. Um, step two is, is optional. I would say about half of the places did something like step two and the other half did not. So step two is a, a, a take home coding test or data analysis test. Um, then you'll have typically a technical phone interview. There may be only one technical phone interview. There may be two or three. Um, and then if you pass all of the other steps, at least in my experience, you get invited to a final on-site interview. And this on-site interview usually lasts you know, a day or so and you meet with a bunch of different people. So there, there are sort of uh, what I call like, like the, four, the four horsemen of, of the apocalypse or the four horsemen of you know, looking for and interviewing for jobs. So this, this first one here is, um, I, I think it's a Python, at least. So, so th this here is to sort of represent uh, coding. Um, not necessarily just Python, but coding in general. Uh, coding is, I, I cannot stress enough to you how important being a good programmer is um, in these interviews. Um, the, second, the second here, this is, this is like business Spider-Man. So this, this, this guy here sort of represents um, something like what I would call you know, business sense or business intelligence in terms of uh, how, how you can look at a business problem and see how you know, data science or data sci science techniques can be applied to it. Um, this guy here, does anyone know who this is? James Poole? No. This, this, is, this is a Sir Francis Galton. Um, he is regarded by statisticians as the father of regression, and he is on here because of all the methods and techniques that you could ever be asked about. I guarantee you 100%, no matter where you go, no matter who you're talking to, no matter what company it is, you will be asked interview questions about regression, okay? Regular regression, logistic regression, lasso, ridge, all that stuff will 100% definitely be asked of you, so you need to make sure that you know it very well, okay? Um, the next one here, so, so this is, if, if I might be dating myself here, but when I was uh, in undergrad, this, this, this guy is a, a meme, uh, this is sort of like the, the clueless freshman meme, and this guy's not here to represent the sorts of things that you would learn in STAT 200. And by STAT 200, I mean hypothesis testing. Um, at a lot of places, I was asked various, frankly, quite simple questions about hypothesis testing. They're not meant to be difficult questions, but they're the sort of thing that if you don't go back and review what you've learned in STAT 200, you might trip up and it, it's a, it, it's, they're, they're sort of easy questions to pass and, and you don't want to fail at them, right? Okay. So, so to talk a little bit about uh, the, the, the Python enforcement. So the, the coding test, usually what happens at least in my experience, is that after you apply or you speak with someone from HR, you are sent a coding test. Um, and the coding test is usually administered on a website called HackerRank, which you may or may not be familiar with. Usually it consists of a couple of questions of varying degrees of difficulty, and the test is typically timed. So you might have you know, one hour per question, or two hours or three hours to do all of the questions. Okay. So you'll do that, um, submit it, and you'll get a grade for it. And basically, depending on how you do on that coding test, that will determine whether or not you'll move on to the technical phone interview. So these, these coding questions um, require a lot of practice. Uh, and, and it's not, not necessarily because the, the questions are super difficult, but you need to practice doing coding things in a timed environment. And these coding questions can range anything from like dynamic programming, if you're familiar with that, to simply you know flipping an array or you know finding manually finding the maximum of a list or diff different sorts of things. Um, so the the way that I recommend preparing for this is to just practice as much as you can every day. Go home and do one question or two questions and and, and keep that up. So there are luckily a lot of resources for doing this. So there's a website called Leap Code, um, which I'm sure probably a lot of you are familiar with. So, and please forgive this. I thought this image would look better than it does. But basically Leap Code has a bunch of different questions on it. Um, and you can see here for various topics, questions are tagged by various topics. So there are questions about you know, arrays, about trees, 
hash tables, things like that, binary search. Um, so this, this is a very good resource to use. I highly recommend uh, using leak code to practice these coding questions. Um, another one is HackerRank. Um, this is the one that usually the coding test will actually be administered on. So I also recommend going to HackerRank and practicing the programming questions there. Um, I myself used both websites. So I would say I was probably doing mm, anywhere from three to five practice questions every day leading up to starting interviews. So I would say starting in August, I was doing like three or five questions every night. Um, it, it, it may be different, uh, you know, if you guys are, are master students or undergrad students, the amount of coding and the time of coding they ask you might be different, but nevertheless, um, I, I think it's a very important thing to practice. Um, okay, so the technical phone interview typically follows a, what I would call like a, a business case. And by that I mean sort of a, a using data science or using data or statistics to answer a business question. So usually the, the way in which these started out, the interviewer would explain to me some sort of business scenario and he would explain what the goal is. You know, what, what are we trying to do? And he would also tell me, you know, what data we have. And he would basically ask, so what do you, you know, what do you think we should do? Right? And so this, this involves a lot of, this is something where you would sort of draw on experience from the projects or from internships, and it involves a lot of sort of what features would you collect, what features from the data could you get, or which features could you create, and importantly, why would you want to collect, or why would you want to create those features? Um, what technique would you like to use, and why would you like to use that technique? Um, some sort of hypothesis testing on the variables that you're including in your model. And finally, lasso. So, at every single, for every single technical phone interview that I had, every last one of them led me to the interviewer asking me about lasso. Inevitably, at some point in the interview, they would say, oh, well, you know, suppose that we just want to throw every variable that we have and we want to do some variable selection or whatever, what are you going to do? Okay, I'm going to do lasso, okay? If you get to a technical phone interview and you remember the principles of lasso, when you should use it, how it works, et cetera, et cetera, I, I almost guarantee that you can pass through the phone interview because I, I, don't, I don't know why it is, but every single interviewer, they love asking about lasso. Um, okay, so then presuming that you pass through the technical phone interview, uh, at least for the sorts of jobs I was applying to, you end up in an on-site interview. Um, so the on-site interview usually lasts a couple of hours. Um, mostly they're about five-ish hours or so. Um, Citibank, uh, I don't know what they were doing there, but they tried to keep me, they, they would have kept me until 12, 12 a.m., I think, if they could have. Um, so the interviews here are, in general, I would say all over the place. So they could ask you anything from different coding questions, like you know, sort of the, the typical like CS type interview, whiteboard coding type deal. Um, they could ask you various math questions. So I was asked several questions about you know proving things, um, several linear algebra questions. Um, also, a lot of similar business case questions. So similar to the technical phone interview, I think you know I, I received a lot of business case type questions. And then also what I would call exam-like questions. And an exam-like question is something along the lines of, you know, explain to me how X algorithm works, or explain to me what X thing is, okay? Um, so here, here's, a, here's a, a sampling of some, some actual questions that I, that I got. Um, I obviously will not say which companies asked me these questions, but you know, these are real questions that I got. Um, and then in, a, in the slide or two after this, I'm going to sort of give you an idea of at what detail uh, I at least was sort of expected to know the answers to, the, to some of these questions, all right? And hopefully that, that can help you, you know, figure out how deep you should know some of the things that I'm going to say. So, for example, um, I was asked a whole host of questions about random forests. Um, how do they work? How does the splitting mechanism work? What is the last function of the splits? Um, how do you do variable selection? What is the difference between a regular random forest and a boosted tree? Things like that. 
Um, all of the assumptions of linear regression, I'll get into that um, a little later. Um, how do you actually, you know, sort of end-to-end -end get data, uh, build a model, validate the model, you know, things like train test splitting, cross-validation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, questions about logistic regression. How does logistic regression differ from standard regression? What is the um, optimization or the, the target function for logistic regression? How do you find the optimal beta? What is the formulation of the logistic regression model? Um, how do you deal with categorical features? So I was, for example, asked, one, how do you deal with categorical features and actually implement the way that you would deal with those categorical features you know, by, by writing a function on the whiteboard? Um, explain how PCA works. Um, this is sort of related to the categorical features, so I was asked to write a function that implemented one-hot decoding, um, but not using, no, no use of, of other libraries to do it for me. So essentially in base Python, write a function, write a function to do that on the whiteboard. Um, okay, so exactly, exactly how deep do I think you should know these things, or at least how deep was I expected to know, or expected to answer these questions? So, for example, for lasso, 100% um, I should definitely be able to write it down, right? Write down the, the objective function. Um, I was also asked, you know, how do I choose lambda and sort of intuitively, what is the purpose of lambda? What, you know, what is, what is lambda actually doing here as a tuning parameter? Um, I was also asked to explain the difference between lasso and ridge regression, not only in the formulation of the objective function, but also in terms of what do the results look like in terms of the betas, right? If you use lasso, how do your estimated betas look? If you use ridge, typically how do your estimated betas look? Um, also, is the beta still unbiased? Um, and the, the, sort of, the sort of breaking point, I would say, is how do you actually implement the lasso? I don't know how to actually implement the lasso other than you know using scikit-learn or whatever. I know that you can go read the original paper by Hasty, uh, and you can see how he implements it there. But this this year, this sort of computational implementation was sort of the the limit of what I was expected to know. Um, so I, I think that for your purposes, if you're preparing to go out and look for jobs, I think that you should have a good idea of at the very least how to answer the first three questions here. I, 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 don't, I don't know because I'm obviously not hiring, but I, I think that, that these seem to be sort of things that people just expected that I would know. Um, as, as another example, and perhaps an even more important one, uh, regression. So what do you need to know about regression? So again, obviously you should be able to write down the objective function. Um, you should also know, sort of off the top of your head, just what the form of the optimal beta is. And not only that, you should probably be able to derive it. Okay, so you should be able to take the derivative, set it equal to zero, solve for beta. Okay. These, these are all things, I guess I should say, that, that I was asked to do. Um, you should also know the assumptions of linear regression, and you should know them very well. So you should be able to say exactly what all of the assumptions are, but more importantly, you should be able to say why do you care about those assumptions. So in which cases are those assumptions important, right? Um, and then also, how do you actually check these assumptions, right? Because you can sort of think that the next question coming after somebody asks you what the assumptions are is how do you check them? Um, specifically, one, one assumption that I found was, was quite common in terms of like, you know, getting follow-up questions was um, the idea of multicollinearity in, um, in the X's. So this one in particular, people like, for some reason, people like to ask about. I assume it's a common problem that comes up. So you should understand what problems multicollinearity in the X matrix causes. Um, and you should also know what the solution is, okay, what you can do about it. Um, and then again, also hypothesis testing. How do you interpret or how do you conduct a hypothesis test on the betas? So I, I think that th this is, I think that all of these questions are sort of at the level that you should be able to answer. So when you, when you go on an interview, um, you should have you know, good answers to all of these questions 
in, in your back pocket because I think that all of these are fair things to ask and frankly pretty common things to ask. I was, I was asked probably five out of six of these at every single interview I had. Um, okay. So another, another skill um, that I, I think kind of gets lost or overlooked when people are preparing for interviews because you know, they're, they're sort of so worried about, about focusing on getting the technical questions correct is um, communication. So one, one, thing that I, one thing that I learned from going on all these interviews is that the, the data science job is, is very collaborative and the, the people that I interviewed with seem to put a very high weight on how much they value communication skills. So communication um, sort of spans a couple of areas. So for example, communication in terms of explaining your past internships or explaining your past, your past projects. Um, communication in terms of explaining concepts and algorithms. So I think it's definitely a good idea to, you know, practice explaining past projects, practice, practice explaining your internships, practice explaining, um, you know, different concepts and different algorithms. Um, and also thinking out loud. So there were a lot of times, particularly on programming questions that I was asked, where I didn't know you know, exactly what to do right right from the start. Or there were math questions I was asked, you know, I was asked to show something and I didn't know what to do right from the start. But I found that it was helpful for me and I also, I think, the interviewers liked it if I sort of talked with them and sort of spoke and thought out loud about what I was thinking and what I was trying to do. This, this number three, I think, is actually the most difficult um, to do because you know, most of us are used to, you know, sitting down and working on homework or sitting down and, you know, doing an exam and we're only thinking in our heads. Um, and and it, it, at least for me, it was actually difficult to, to practice thinking out loud in that way. So what I would recommend is when you, when you study or when you prepare for interviews, that you actually talk to yourself about what you're reading or, you know, just speak out loud about what you're thinking because it will help make that a bit more natural when you actually go into interviews. Um, okay, so so my, my final advice to you is um, to study, uh, study a lot, and especially don't neglect the coding because the coding is very important. Um, I, I've I've told some of my my fellow students um, in the PhD program about my interview experience, and one thing they asked me because, as, as some of you may know, statistics in the department we primarily use R. Um, so they asked me, you know, is it, is it okay if I only use R or if I go to Python? Um, so what, what I will say to that is R is definitely used um, at a lot of places. In my experience, Python is used much more. Um, you cannot go on leap code and you cannot go on hacker rank and program in R. Okay, you either have to use Java or Python or C or C++, etc. So when you're practicing the coding, like you know, on lead code or hacker rank, you cannot practice using R. Okay. Um, when you're actually on the phone with someone or at an on-site interview and they ask you to program something, uh, in my experience, they would basically let you use whatever you know syntax or whatever language you wanted to use. Um, but my my personal recommendation is. At, at, at the very least, for the for the purposes of you know practicing and preparing and looking for jobs, that you sort of focus your efforts um, into Python, unless you're you know specifically trying to work at like the R Foundation or something like that. Okay. Um, the other the other sort of final thing that I want to remind you, and th this may be the the most important part of the job search, is um, to to always be applying to places. Um, I cannot tell you how many jobs I applied to. I kept a spreadsheet. Um, it, it was at least over a hundred different positions. Okay. Um, the, the job market is is good, but at the same time, there is a lot of competition. These jobs are highly desirable. You know, a lot of people are interested in, in data science, programming, statistics, things like that. So, the, you, you really your best strategy is to just apply to as many places as you. And I think that is it. Are there, are there any questions?
time for a few questions. questions. <laughs> Are there any? Yes. One question. We on the uh, testing, code testing on the uh, uh, what's that? Uh, online. I knew it. So this comes on all PPIs. Right. So I, I. So, so the question is, I guess, if, if you guys can't hear, when you take the, the coding tests online and they time you, do they look at how long it takes you to answer the question? Um, so on the instructions, they say that they do not time you. They say that if you submit in 59 minutes, it's no different than submitting in five minutes. Um, do I believe them? I don't know. But that's what they say. Yeah. Yes? Another question. In your um, experience, I know you said you had to take the test. Did, the, did you ever get like a case study, say, went over like a hundred thousand points and analyze it, then have to write a report, and then do the presentation? Because I never had the time to test, but I always had like a huge report, two days that really. Sure. Two days. So, so I interestingly enough, um, so I myself only got that that sort of exam from one place. Um, and there, there's was sort of, sort of like you, like you said, um, you know, pretty big data set. They, they essentially wanted me to analyze it and answer a set of questions, and I did it like in a, in a Jupyter notebook, and you have to add all sorts of commentary and things like that. Um, I know that that happens sort of generally, but it, at least for me, I only have one place to do that to. Me. Yeah, I, I, I frankly uh, don't like that very much, um, but yeah, that, that, yeah. It's good for the company to get a lot of free work. <laughs> yeah. I also keep in mind, Will is a PhD student in statistics, so what he's been asked to do may be a little different. I yeah. Didn't that yeah. Little. Um, if you're more in a coding uh, job, maybe more coding, less, less math. But I think a lot of the, the, the lessons that he shared were, 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 were on his point. Uh, any other questions? Maybe I have time for one more? No, I think we got a bunch of people who say, we need to go home tonight and get on all right, so now we're going to transition to our second speaker. Um, Ms. Alish is going to talk about being a data scientist. So we're transitioning now, if you actually are one. Uh, with that, let's welcome you. Thanks, William. That was a good overview of how um, an interview process for a data scientist works. And yeah, I've been there around uh, one and a half years ago. Um, yeah, like William mentioned, the uh, process of like traditional machine learning, uh, I would like to go more into like modern uh, machine learning and what they call AI. Uh, and then I'll dive into what I have been uh, learning at Verizon Media uh, for the past one and a half years. Uh, first of all, I'm Mithilesh, Mithilesh Nanj. Um, I work as a data scientist with Yahoo, which is now called Verizon Media. Uh, it's just right across the street. The building is uh, pretty good. You should come visit <laughs> or be interviewed. So first of all, uh, let me dive into uh, robotics and the introduction and history of it. Uh, sorry, it's not really very clear here. Uh, so how initially uh, robotics around like 20 or 30 years ago started was uh, First, first in the line of military, where they have like multiple sensors attached to uh, a robot, and they have like a set of rules that the robot has to uh, abide by. Uh, and then you have actuators where uh, the robot is made to move based on the rules uh, that you apply based on the situation. So as you can see, uh, uh, this is very different from the current uh, robots that we are. They have been designing, right? Uh, so it's just a deterministic way of uh, robotics where there's just an actuator which uh, obeys a certain set of rules and then it uh, just implements. So that has been, that was the traditional uh, robotics industry uh, around uh, 30 years ago. After that, uh, cognitive technologies came into picture and then uh, scaling it to the next step is what is called as cognitive automation, where uh, a lot of machine learning, instead of abiding by the set of rules that is given by the designer, uh, the machine learns on itself uh, based on the training that it has undergone. So uh, that is the phase where we are 
and a lot of research and a lot of startups have uh, boomed in this field and we will uh, see more of examples from different startups uh, later in this slide. Yeah, this is like a gen generic robot design. Um, so these are the basic requirements for a robot, right? Like you should have a source of power, need a battery or a direct current, and you should have sensors. Uh, these sensors can be anything based on your use case. Uh, most of the sensors have um, cameras right now. Um, so most of the robots have uh, cameras as their sensors uh, uh, in, in the current uh, AI field. And input output ports, uh, more, more like controllers, which could uh, lead the communication to the actuators on the inputs or outputs. And the actuator is where uh, software binds with the hard hardware, right? So the machine learns the rules and then uh, applies it to the actuator which actually moves and then a contingency frame framework. A contingency framework is uh, just like a backup so what if your uh, robot tips down or what if your robot gets destroyed or like, this is for just for contingency like uh, an emergency backup plan. So that is the generic robot design and computer vision and robots. So right now um, how Almost all, all of the robots have uh, cameras and computer vision, right? And uh, a lot of the cars, if you uh, notice, in the recent two or three years have semi-autonomous navigation where it can uh, help you stay in the lane or even turn in many aspects. So this is a general uh, framework for computer vision where uh, image acquisition is from the sensor, uh, which is the camera here and image pre-processing, a lot of pre-processing steps involved in um, computer vision and future extraction, uh, like say if you, want, if you just want the edges in the uh, image, you just segment the edges from the images and uh, use that as features for your uh, prediction or classification or whatever the task is. So after that, you, yeah, like I said, image segmentation and the final step is image classification if it's a classification problem. Uh, this is the general framework for computer vision. So technologies and tools used in uh, computer vision right now, uh, basically deep learning methods. So deep learning methods has, uh, so it all started from convolution neural networks. Uh, so convolution neural networks is a simple design uh, which was mainly oriented for uh, image data and after that uh, they blocked a lot of or uh, staged a lot of networks, convolution neural networks in a certain way and then uh, they've introduced certain uh, fixed network designs for example like transformers uh, so I, I don't want to get into technical details of those but those are the uh, recent uh, or cutting edge technologies that are used currently in the computer vision field so like I said, gen, uh, generative adversarial networks, GANs and transformers have been uh, in modern day computer vision usage. And what are the tools and hardware used in computer vision? So right now TensorFlow and Keras are uh, predominantly used for any uh, image data. Uh, and you certainly have, have to have GPUs uh, in a profitably distributed environment where, you, uh, where the GPUs are capable of uh, reading all your images like in high uh, resolutions and also uh, processing it more efficiently than the traditional CPUs and non-distributed non environment. After that, uh, yeah, Python probably to read uh, images but not much of Python used in computer vision and uh, PyTorch is specifically for natural language processing models and uh, OpenCV is just to like pre-process the images, like read the images and <coughs> Uh, you can segment it based on your uh, requirements. Applications. Yeah. Um, so recently there was a conference held just for AI and robotics from TechCrunch. Uh, that happened in April and uh, a lot of companies showcase their uh, innovation, the cutting edge robotics in 
use of AI or computer vision in innovation. Uh, so Boston Dynamics, as you almost have, almost everyone would have known, uh, is a cutting edge robotics design uh, company. And they have introduced uh, two models, or they exposed uh, two models on the field, uh, uh, which is called Handle and Spot Mini. So, Handle here consists of free flowing base. Like the base, if you see, the, it's just two wheels, so it would move around. Uh, I'll, I'll just demo that in a video here. So you can see how it's different from con conventional robots, right? So it has to manage the center of gravity and uh, using the free flow of the base movement, it can uh, it makes it more efficient. And if you notice, another task that the robot is doing is that it's going and standing in front of the cargo boxes, and it has cameras in the front, which analyzes if the ca uh, which cargo box to pick up and then places it on the rails or wherever the navigation is set up to. So all this is automated, nothing is like uh, controlled by a controller or anything. But uh, yeah, so there are a lot of complexities in designing this robot and uh, it's, it's actually a complex problem to solve. Uh, Boston Dynamics came up with this uh, handle model and they are commercializing it in the next, uh, in the coming fall. Uh, it has to manage the center of gravity and uh, it has to have an image classification model uh, to identify the cargo boxes and where to place them and more to target like the autonomous navigation of uh, moving to or getting to the target and detecting the stopping criteria like when when the robot should stop uh, it, that should also sense be sensed Another application is Spot Mini from the same Boston Dynamics company. <laughs> As you can see, it's a four legged robot. Uh, it resembles a dog, but it's much more complicated than a dog. Uh, it has like a, a, an autonomous navigation module inbuilt, uh, which navigate, which makes the robot navigate, and it can sense obstacles. As you can see, it's like a real world environment, right? It's an office, but still, it goes without hitting anything. So it has to have an impeccable uh, obstacle detection module in place to actually do that so perfectly. And for any uh, autonomous navigation system, you need to have a GPS, which is inbuilt as well. So it, it was tested in multiple uh, environments, and it is so rugged. Uh, it, it was trained to actually uh, climb up stairs and get down the stairs and all, all different terrains. It was, it, you, you should look up on this particular robot. It's like a really complicated problem to solve if you have uh, learned about computer vision and you would know how uh, they have worked really well to attain this. So the other one is NVIDIA Project ISEC. So right now how a robot uh, if you want to start up a robotic uh, company and if you want to de design a robot, uh, you should have all the components, basic requirements uh, or components that I've uh, showed you earlier. Uh, you have to bring that from your own investment, right? Like you have to design your hardware, you have to design your uh, software. But what NVIDIA has uh, given us is that a tool or SDK, software development kit called ISEC, which, is, uh, which has open source basic um, computer vision inbuilt and also a lot of other things. 
So you you just have to uh, since since the software is open source, you can just uh, use the API and uh, build it into your robot and add whatever modules you want to to the API in the robot. So uh, right now it contains uh, a robot engine as well, which is 3D printed. Uh, so that is open source, as in um, it is not patented. So you can buy that online and then uh, use the SDK which is free uh, and apply that on your engine and get whatever functionality you want. So yeah, it also, it also comes with a simulate, uh, simulation where you can simulate all your uh, computer vision modules that you have built or uh, the open source or if you are using the open source uh, software. You can test, test that using the tool to simulate uh, that as well. So this is this is pretty exciting, right? Like for a startup, you don't have to worry about uh, getting your own hardware and software. You you can just start from you you don't have to start from the scratch. You can just start from probably like 50 percent of the work, and then you just have the remaining 50 percent to complete. These are two robots from NVIDIA, which is, which is called Kaya and Carter. So this Kaya robot is built from uh, the ISEC kit, means uh, it has the basic ISEC uh, SDK and the 3D printed hardware. So as you can see, uh, the Kaya robot is uh, Yeah, so the Kaya robot is used, in this case, is used to uh, classify if the trash in the center is compost or uh, recycled trash. So it is a simple image classification, not simple, uh, it's an image classification problem and uh, they have, so you just have to build the final step and integrate to the API in the ISEC software and uh, implement that on your 3D printed hardware. And you get this. So this is the this is called Kaya. And they have taken that to the next step and built Carter. So this is an internal food delivery robot that NVIDIA uses uh, currently. So you just have to order the food and it will come to your office and deliver it. So this is called Carter. So what is amazing in this is uh, it, it shows you how easy it is to integrate with another software. Uh, so like I said, how, how do you book uh, for food? So in NVIDIA, what they use is they use Slack channel as their food ordering system. So they just use, uh, they just, it's just one ping away, right? So if you just ping on Slack, it's just integrated to the software on this uh, Carter robot. and in half an hour you get the food, food at your office. And this is built with ISEC SDK as well. This one's pretty cool. Uh, this is my favorite one actually. So this is called Kiwi Bot. Uh, so this is uh, inside the Berkeley, UC Berkeley campus. Uh, they are a startup uh, which delivers food and uh, supplies any supply that you ask for within the campus. So it has the it has a map uh, or a GPS system attached to it. And uh, as you can see, the design is pretty simple, right? Uh, you just go to the location and uh, deliver the food, but it is in the real world, so that makes it more complicated. So it has to walk through the pavements and uh, meet the person or deliver it uh, accurately and also efficiently. So, yeah, so it is partial autonomous navigation. It uh, doesn't uh, have 100% autonomous navigation, so someone will be controlling from the back, but when you compare to the uh, current food delivery systems, like 
uh, one person can deliver food for one customer in around like 45 minutes or one hour. But one person can control multiple KB bots and uh, they actually prove by calculation and uh, from their sales that it is 15 times more efficient than a uh, regular or regular food delivery system. And uh, yeah, so it, is, it has like a computation module inbuilt and a GPS system inbuilt as well, which makes that possible. The next one is drone seed. Uh, so what this company does is each year there's about 15 million acres of forest that are turned into the way to make reforestation and carbon sequestration. The forest is inside to make a lot of slash for agriculture. And drone seed we're trying not to use the forest for the trees. Yeah, so this drone seed is um, basically a reforestation drone or a robot. Um, so it works with multiple. So they work with multiple timber uh, organizations. So what the timber organizations do is they cut a lot of trees, right? But they are bound to uh, reforest the trees. Like the government has uh, a law which states that uh, any timber company should should reforest if they are cutting a uh, cutting trees, basically. So what uh, this particular drone uh, does is. So for, for the timber companies to actually hire uh, uh, human labor and to deforest is pretty expensive. So uh, this drone seed company offers offers a drone or a robot to actually do that. So uh, what it has is it has a multiple uh, camera system which uh, uh, detects obstacles on the air and also uh, a GPS system to get there. And also a load of carrying, carrying chassis, which uh, has a lot of seeds, which spray uh, when it reaches the location. So the drone reaches the location and sprays the seeds. And currently, they say the survival rate is around 10%. Like around 10% of the all the seeds that are sprayed uh, grow into trees. Uh, so this is much more efficient than uh, manual labor, right? Like uh, the reforestation can be much. Uh, faster and more number of trees in a very short time, which which impacts the climate change uh, positively. So that is, what, that is what this company is doing. So yeah, and the applications goes um, on and on. Like there are a lot of startups which have come up with computer vision and uh, implementing the computer vision system onto the robots and uh, that is that is the recent uh, research area of interest among most of the uh, computer science students or computer science research fellows so uh, yeah this you, you can just this is just an open area right like deep learning there's so much so many things to learn in deep learning uh, you can just uh, get in, get a kick start by starting with uh, TensorFlow and starting to read about convolutional neural networks and image data. Uh, and there are a lot, lot of image data sets in the UCI repository, uh, open repository and uh, Kaggle data sets as well. Um, yeah, it's, it's really cool to try on and uh, see how it actually comes out. And now, uh, being a data scientist, so William uh, presented about like how uh, data science uh, interview is, and uh, that is pretty much how uh, all the interviews go. And I passed one such interview like one and a half years ago, and I'm here right now. I, I'm just gonna uh, go over what are, the, what are the things or differences uh, between being a grad student and uh, being actually a data scientist in in the industry. Yeah, uh, like I said, I was a master's data science student at Indiana University, Bloomington, and uh, I joined last February uh, at Yahoo. And the key la key aspects of learning, uh, there are there are infinite things I should say, but these are the most important things that I thought of that came to my mind first. So, first is building scalable and end-to-end -end solutions. So, till the grad grad school period or uh, undergrad school period, 
we would have learned a lot of uh, data science methods and we would also implement them in uh, different projects, right? So you use uh, open data and I've used open data and it has been very, uh, so it is just apply this algorithm and get this output, evaluate the model and uh, post the results. So that has pretty much been uh, my project life, I would say. And uh, w one of the research projects was different, but uh, all the other projects were pretty much the same thing. But when I uh, came to Verizon Media, I, uh, I had to think about end-to-end -end solutions, right? Like how uh, business has to be uh, enhanced or improved by with the help of data scientists. So, yeah, I, I learned a lot from our data science team. Uh, we have a really good team uh, in various media where there are a lot of experienced people that I can learn from uh, every day. And uh, I learned from them that you have to think about the bigger picture, not just uh, applying an algorithm and getting the results. So that is one uh, key aspect when I got into the industry that I had to learn. And tools and languages and techniques to learn, uh, it's always ever growing, right? Like today, it will be uh, some tool that we have to learn. Uh, and tomorrow, it can be a different thing. But you have to have uh, an ecosystem to actually learn and implement that. And uh, that is what I uh, observe when I joined Verizon Media. There, there is a lot of tools and open source tools and a lot of data scientists use those tools to implement their business problems and that is pretty pretty good. Uh, that is actually the greatest uh, learning experience I've had. And real world data sets. So real world data sets are much much different from the open data sets that are available. Uh, so open data sets usually tend to be like really clean. Like you just have to do one or two pre-processing steps to get into building the model. But real world data sets are not like that. So it, they are like you. There's probably like ten uh, number of pre-processing steps that you have to actually do, and then get to the model building part. So that is uh, very different. That was very different when I joined. And also uh, scalable solutions. So scalable solutions is uh, we. When I was doing my projects, I, I was uh, kind of using smaller data sets, uh, smaller than what I, what I am using right now. So right now it's all big data, all the, da uh, all the data is on such huge scale. And your usual algorithms that uh, we have uh, come across in the grad school or even before that, wouldn't, wouldn't work uh, efficiently on a big data system. So uh, I learned a lot about how you have to uh, implement certain things when you, the data that you're dealing with is big data. And model evaluation, uh, so it's not just about accuracy, right? Um, so model evaluation, there are a lot of things in model evaluation that I came to know, uh, and it has to be, most important thing is, is it has to be aligned with the business goal. So uh, there are, yeah, I learned a lot about that. Collaboration and learning, as I said, there is a good data science team uh, in my company that I'm fortunate to be in. And uh, we usually hold data, data science reading groups and working groups uh, to collaborate among ourselves and share our knowledge. And uh, that has been a really good learning experience for me. And keeping up with cutting edge, uh, the collaborative learning actually helped us to keep, uh, keep up with the cutting edge technology. Since we have like a uh, reading group, as I mentioned, uh, we have to always uh, read like the research papers or publications that have that have been coming up uh, to just stay in uh, in the technology and know what is going to come next. So, yeah, and self evaluation. Like every time uh, I look at other data scientists, I analyze myself and uh, evaluate myself, and that. Uh, increases your learning as well. So, yeah, that, that has been pretty much my experience uh, in the past one and a half years, and that's, that's about it. So, so we're actually a little over time. Uh, maybe one quick question, otherwise I'd encourage you to come up. Is there a quick question? Sure. Can you give an example of how you can data science to improve business better? That's not a quick question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, usually, 
so the product managers are the ones who uh, come up with business cases or uh, product cases where they require a data science method. Uh, so usually uh, for in our team it's uh, something predictive uh, and it goes through a process of like product manager handing over the pro product to your manager and the manager, my manager understands data science uh, very well. So uh, it's, it's about getting that business mindset uh, is a little difficult when you enter uh, into the real world from grad school. So it's just uh, aligning your scope and aligning your uh, ev model evaluation basically your uh, business metrics and that that is uh, pretty much what I do. All right, so with that we're ahead, most speakers will be around. Uh, just a, a reminder, we will not have a data science research group in July because it would be July 5th and you can have to be around. Uh, so the next one will actually be in August. All right, that looks like our speaker will ask that.